Why is it important for MFIs to listen to their clients? Microfinance is essentially a retail operation, and just like any other retail operation, you need to know what your customers want. I think it's as simple as that. There may be a, a particular problem in microfinance. It's not an area that in the past has been well researched, and it is, has become vulnerable to people just making assumptions about what the poor want. That may be aggravated by the, by the social distinctions. Most of the people who offer microfinance are socially and educationally at a higher rank than most of their clients, so that leads to a temptation to think that we know best and we, we probably know better than they do what they need. So for all those kinds of reasons, we need to correct that tendency, get back down into the field, talk to the clients themselves, find out how they are using the products, find out how we can improve it based on their usage and of their products and of what they're doing anyway, aside from the, the other kinds of uh, services they're using apart from the ones that you're offering them and so on and so forth. And how might microfinance organisations conduct that type of research? To begin with, it needn't necessarily be the microfinance organisation itself that conducts the research because it may well be that they can tap into research that others are doing for them. So the question I think perhaps is, is more general is about how you go about finding out what customers want. And I think the answer there is, is simply to go directly to them. Uh, you can do that in a number of ways, one of which would be through traditional uh, market research systems such as focus groups and so on, something which uh, Microsave is, is good at and has made a, made a practice of in improving. Or you can go directly to them and work at, uh, at an individual or a household level, which has been the kind of work that I've generally done and you will find that you need to make repeated visits and you need to ask questions repeatedly because for various reasons the uh, early information that you get may not be very reliable so you need to do a lot of double checking and triple checking if, you, if you're going to get a really accurate picture of uh, how people manage their money and what kind of tools they need from you to help them manage it better. How was the research for Portfolios of the Poor conducted? Portfolios of the Poor is a book about uh, a series of research endeavours that began in Bangladesh around about 2000, in which we were recognising the fact that there was very little written or researched up to now about how people in general manage their money, poor people in general manage their money. I was well placed to do this because of my own personal idiosyncratic background. I developed a hobby of looking at how poor people manage their money that goes way back to really before microfinance was invented, before that magic year 1976, which is when Dr. Yunus started uh, working with the, what became the Grameen Bank. Uh, my interest had always been in uh, what kind of mechanisms, what kind of devices and services poor people themselves use to manage their money. And I had already by then written a book called The Poor and Their Money, which is a kind of a survey of all the different kinds of devices and, and services that I'd found being used by poor people around the world, really, in three continents, many countries in three continents, in both urban and rural settings. So. When there was an opportunity funded by British Aid, DFID, and run by an academic institution that I'm associated with at the University of Manchester, we set ourselves the target of trying to find, dig a little bit more deeply into the money management habits of a select, small, but select, carefully selected group of poor families that would go beyond the kind of anecdotal stories that I'd picked up in my travels around the world and allow us to put the information into some kind of framework that could be analysed. And our way of doing that was by inventing this research technique which we call financial diaries. Now these are not diaries in the literal sense because most of the people about whom the financial diaries are written are illiterate, so they're not able themselves to keep diaries. These are really the records of a series of visits that uh, well-trained local investigators, local researchers made to a group of selected poor families. And the object was 
to understand in as much detail as possible every single penny that went in and out of financial services and devices and as much as possible to understand how that forms part of the general income and expenditure flows of the household and at the same time to record what poor people said about the process, what they felt about the, the, the task of managing money, what kind of services uh, they were most comfortable with, which, what were the snags, what were the advantages and disadvantages of the various um, services and, and devices that they were using. We ran this series of visits over a full year in order to make sure that we captured any elements caused by seasonality. As I say, we did the first round of uh, financial diaries in Bangladesh, quickly followed by a set in India. And then, uh, based on the results of what we got in Bangladesh and India, some people got interested in the technique and a, a much better funded and a much better service uh, set of diaries with a much bigger sample was subsequently done in South Africa. And um, those three, the Bangladesh, the Indian and the South African financial diaries, were subsequently written up into the book that came out last year called The Portfolios of the Poor. I understand you did this for Grameen too as well. Yes. Another uh, set of diaries with a, with a more specific objective. The, the objective of the first sets of diaries was simply to find out how poor people manage their money. Uh, it was simply to discover whether it was uh, true that poor households are financially inactive or whether they're financially active, whether, as common prejudice may have it, poor people just live hand-to-mouth and don't engage much in financial in intermediation, or whether, in fact, they, they do engage in a large amount of financial intermediation, which was our finding that they do indeed do that. We then did a, a set of diaries in Bangladesh from 2002 to 2005 that had a more specific purpose, and that was to look at the money management habits of people who also account holders of organizations in Bangladesh, such as the Grameen Bank and ASHA and BRAC, the famous Bangladeshi NGO MFIs. And this was a piece of work that was uh, funded by Microsave and it formed part of a wider investigation into Grameen 2. Grameen 2 is the name of the way in which Grameen Bank relaunched its products and greatly, in my opinion, greatly improved its products after it got into trouble in the late 1990s.